Namaste, good evening and good morning to uh, Dr. Hari and uh, Mukesh. It's a pleasure to welcome my hemophilia family to this very important uh, webinar on gene therapy. Many of us have keenly been waiting for um, this topic to be spoken upon and I'm confident and sure that we will learn a lot today. On behalf of uh, Hemophilia Federation India, the blood disorders community in India, I extend a special welcome and thanks to our guest of honor, Dr. Parmeshwaran Ravi, MD, MRCP. Dr. Hari, we welcome you to our Hemophilia family, Hemophilia Federation family. Thank you for being here with us today. Dr. Hari has many years of experience in oncology, hematology, and has proven his mettle in clinical practice, academia, and research. He's been kind enough to give us his valuable time and share his knowledge with us today. We are honored to have you with us. Dr. Hari has served across three continents and now is the chief hematologist at Medical College of Wisconsin and is in charge of gene therapy in blood disorders. I got to know Dr. Hari through uh, Jimmy, whose brother is Dr. Hari's college mate. We requested him to talk on this topic to our HFI audience and he readily agreed despite his busy schedule. We are fortunate to have such a revered doctor like Dr. Hari amongst us. Thank you, sir, and we will once again welcome you to Hemophilia Federation India. We will be hearing from him in a short while. Now, I request our president, Dr. Um, Mr. Mukesh Garodia, to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Prem. And it's always good to hear, though I am not as educated to be said as doctor. I, I always like the word when you say Dr. Mukesh Garodia. But anyways, yeah, yeah first of all, yeah, thank you so much, Prem. And first of all, I would like to welcome Dr. Hari and sparing time for us so that educate us on gene therapy. Uh, talking about myself, I'm a person with hemophilia in the 70s from taking whole blood to the 80s to coming to cryo and plasma and then going to the IV injections. And from there, we see the paradigm shift on hemophilia treatment globally to subcutaneous products to now we are talking about gene therapy. So we are fortunate that in my lifetime, it's, been, it's, it's, it's becoming a real, it, it's not a dream anymore. And we see, we, I have many friends right now who have been successful in getting gene therapy from UK and from US. At the same time, there are many others who are undergoing the gene therapy trial. So we are very fortunate that hopefully in coming years, we will see that there will be less hemophiliacs due to the success of gene therapy. So on behalf of Hemophilia Federation India, I welcome all the participants. And I believe that it will be this one hour, one and a half hour will be a learning journey for us so that we educate ourselves through Dr. Hari about gene therapy. Thank you so much. And let's, let's move ahead and go ahead as per the agenda. Thank you so much, Prem. Uh, I request Dr. Srikant Apte to say a few words, please. Sir, uh, Apte, sir, you are, uh, you are is on mute. So you are turn... still on mute, Doctor. Sure, sure. I, I got it. I got it. Sorry. Thank you, Prem, for organizing this uh, webinar. And I thank Hari for joining us and who is going to enlighten us. Hari is a very kind man and a dear friend to me. And Hari, you, you could see the interest in hemophilia community in the country where we have moved from paucity of products to some products and now we are talking of cure. And I don't think there is any better person than you, Hari, to speak on this to this uh, uh, gathering. I request Hari to proceed with his presentation. Um, I request uh, Jimmy Manuel to uh, give a brief of uh, Dr. Hari. Yeah. Good evening, all. Uh, respected President HFI Sri Mugesh Garodia, Vice President Dr. Shashi Nantapti, Regional Council Chairman uh, Sri Prem Ru Balwa, and my dear blood brothers and sisters. Uh, I take it brings me great honor to introduce to you Dr. Parameshwar Hari. In fact, uh, uh, he is one of the reputed doctors and a well-known person in the field of 
uh, gene therapy in blood disorders. Uh, Dr. Hari, in fact, uh, is a very close friend of my brother, Dr. Jose Manuel, who is professionally a radiologist. And that's how we came together for this meeting. Uh, actually, one month back, I think it's more than one month, uh, I attended a webinar on uh, COVID, the pandemic COVID. It was an international conference. And uh, Dr. Hari was also a, uh, a person who talked on the scientific side of, hematological side of corona. So ma many international doctors spoke on the scientific side of uh, corona. And uh, actually what got into me is that Dr. Hari talked on the management through a parable. That was a very catchy thing because uh, his, I, I remember that it was something like a police station, a thief, policeman, something like that. You see, Dr. Harry. <laughs> okay. So even a primary school student also could understand what is Corona and how it is managed and what are the difficulties in managing the Corona. So immediately it got into mind that my mind that I should get Dr. Hari to speak for us in our next webinar. So I contacted my brother. My brother contacted Dr. Hari. He gave his number. And that, uh, that's how it started. Uh, next, uh, the very next day morning, I you know, talked to Sri Premlu Balba. And uh, we had a lengthy discussions how to bring him on what subject. Anyway, thank you, Dr. Hari, for joining us. The main challenge, as we all know, that uh, it was his time schedule because it is a very important uh, department he is handling. And during the COVID time, he was very, very busy with a lot of his professional practice, a um, lot of webinars on the line. Still, somehow he managed to come with us. Thanks a lot. And uh, just a few words about Dr. Hari. Dr. Parameshwaran Hari. Dr. Parameshwaran Hari had his MBBS in the year 1992 from University of Kerala and his MD in 1995 from the Jawaharlal Nehru Institute of Postgraduate Medicine. He then completed fellowship in internal medicine and hematology at the Royal College of Physicians and Royal College of Pathologists in the United Kingdom. He had his medical oncology and transplantation at the Medical College of Wisconsin, USA. In 2013, Dr. Harry received the Grassroots Champion for Patient Access Award from the Association of Community Cancer Center for promoting clinical efforts in the field of blood cancers. He has several publications in his name. In the year 2017-18, he has peer selected Best Doctor of America. After training and serving across three continents, Dr. Hari is now the Chief Hematologist of Medical College of Wisconsin and is in charge of gene therapy in blood disorders. I wish Dr. Hari a great success in all his endeavors. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Hari. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. Uh, thank you, uh, Prem and uh, um, uh, Mr. Garodia and my old friend, uh, um, Dr. Shashiate. Um, Jimmy and I go back a very, very long time. Jimmy is the younger brother of my uh, schoolmate, uh, Joe Manuel. And um, I still remember, uh, Jimmy probably doesn't remember me, but uh, you know, when you're in school and you have friends, you remember their brothers, sisters, parents, everybody. So I still remember Jimmy and Joseph's dad uh, dropping him off. Uh, so I remember, I know Jimmy from when he was in fifth class or even probably even younger when he was in, uh, in, a, in a lower primary school because Joe's and I, we studied together from first standard to 10th grade together. So in any way, it is a very, very long association and I'm very happy to uh, be in front of all of you. So a um, couple of things. I am, uh, I, I, I am a hematologist for sure. And I have treated a lot of hemophilia patients when I was in training and before I became a blood cancer specialist. Right now, what I do mostly is treatment of blood cancers and transplantation and uh, basically gene modified cellular therapies. That's what most of my research is. So it turns out that at the Medical College of Wisconsin, we have a very um, a very powerful blood group and a blood research group. 
Uh, I hope everybody can see the slides now. Um, the, our group um, has cloned a lot of genes, including one million fractal gene for the first time and many, many unique well, first in human achievements. You know, we were the group who discovered B12. In fact, uh, my, my professorship is called Arman Quick Professor. And um, old time hematologists know who Arman Quick was. He is the, do he's the um, doctor who invented what is now known as the INR, the most common blood clotting test. In fact, the most commonly ordered blood test in the entire world. So, uh, you know, Dr. Quick invented this uh, at, in Wisconsin. So Wisconsin has a long history of blood cancers, blood, uh, blood um, hemophilia and uh, blood clotting disorder treatment. So what happened is uh, when I came here and I was doing gene therapy and gene modification, the blood doctors, the hemophilia specialists came and came to me and said, let's collaborate and we will try to create our own gene therapy for hemophilia. So I became interested in this topic. And for the last decade, we have been working together. And uh, very recently this year, we actually got approval from the federal government and various regulatory agencies in the US to start our gene therapy trial. Our trial is actually now open. And we have actually, uh, I will show you how we got there and all that, but we have to prove that it works. So we had to prove it from cellular level to a dog level. So our gene therapy works all the way up to a dog. And if a patient shows up tomorrow, we can actually offer this to that patient in a clinical trial now. Anyway, so let's talk about gene therapy. I, rem I understand that there are people of very, uh, very varying levels of education about hemophilia in this audience. So I will uh, keep it at a, um, um, a level where I will explain everything. So if it feels uh, repetitive to you, uh, that is because I want to get to everybody who is in this audience. So, um, sorry. So the basics of um, hemophilia, as everyone knows here, is that you know we have clotting factors in the blood. These are proteins, and proteins um, are um, building blocks uh, that can build anything in our human body. Our human body is essentially structurally composed of protein. So uh, for you know, and these proteins are coming from genes. Basically, genes are instructions to make proteins. So every uh, protein that our body makes, there is an instruction which tells the body how to make that protein. So it's written down somewhere. And that written down instruction resides um, in our um, cells. And in the cells, each cell can decide which protein to make and when they make it. So every cell in our human body has the same set of instructions. So think of it as a computer. So you have a computer, I have a computer. There are 100 people sitting in a room with various computers. One guy is actually taking pictures with, this, with his computer. Another guy is taking or participating in Zoom with the computer. Another person is listening to music on his computer. Another person is typing Word document on his computer. Everybody has all the programs, but each at each time, a different program is playing in each person's computer. And which set of programs is play, playing at any one time, we call that gene expression. So every cell in our body has the same set of instructions. It has the same set of instructions and it can do every, any all of that but they don't do all of that at the same time. At one time, it's only doing two or three instructions. So that's the main thing to understand. So there are a lot of genes and the same set of genes exist in every individual of the same species. So if you're a human, your genes, what genes you have are the same across all humans, but what your cells are doing and where they are doing it is completely independent of each other. So your liver cells are carrying out one set of instructions, your heart cells are carrying out a different set of instructions, but the liver cells also have the same instructions that the heart cells have, but they're just not carrying that, those instructions out at this time. They are just participating in what liver cells do. So now factor eight, which is the hemophilia A factor, the deficiency of factor eight leads to hemophilia. Again, as everybody knows, factor nine deficiency leads to hemophilia B. So factor eight gene is the gene that tells cells to produce factor eight. In fact, all our cells have factor eight gene in them, but only a few cells make factor eight. And in the last decade, we have figured out which cells make factor eight, and that has an important implications for gene therapy. So when a patient has hemophilia A, they, the major treatment as uh, uh, um, Mr. Garodia said, is to re replace that factor eight, hemophilia factor eight um, deficient people, when they get factor eight from the outside, either through whole blood in the old days, cryoprecipitate in the, in the intermediate period, and then factors, uh, purified factors uh, from, you know, trans in, from donated blood, and then now recombinant factors, then now extended half-life products, subcutaneous products, and now there is even monoclonal antibodies, which do the function of factor eight, but are not really factor eight. So essentially, we have come all the way there. 
And the most recent factors that we in infuse are actually recombinant factors. And recombinant factors means the factor is not produced from people who already have made it in their bodies. You know, when you collect a pe people's blood and purify the factor rate from that blood, that factor rate comes from people's bodies in from somebody's liver in, and it was in their blood and then they donated the blood and from there it became cryoprecipitate and then became purified factor eight. But when we are making factor eight at a large level, we are making it actually in recombinant fashion, which means actually a genetically engineered cell is making it. So genetic engineering has actually already working for all of you. If you're using a recombinant factor, it is some, some genetic engineering that made that factor eight. Um, so hemophilia A and B, uh, they are both known as single gene disorders because it is the deficiency of one gene that leads to it. Most of the diseases that affect human beings are actually not single gene disorders, but single gene disorders are very amenable to gene therapy because we fix that one gene, we can fix the whole problem. So it is a dysfunctional factor eight that leads to hemophilia A and a dysfunctional factor um, uh, nine that leads to hemophilia B. And both of those are coming from um, the um, single gene abnormality. Now, where does a gene sit? So I told you genes are instructions how to make proteins. Factor eight and nine are proteins. And the gene is sitting somewhere in the body. So in, within every cell, there is a nucleus and that's where all the instructions are. And within the nucleus, there is an area called the, the uh, nuclear protein where, where you have this long um, coiled DNA sitting in a, 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 what we call a chromosome. And human beings have 23 pairs of chromosomes. It really doesn't matter. Actually, the DNA uh, looks like it's sitting in chromosomes. Actually, it's one, land, one, one big chunk of instruction sitting there. It's like a big manual. And you think of it as the manual for a plane. If you have seen the manual for a, flying a plane or repairing a plane, it is volumes and volumes of books. So it's like 20 volumes. And you, you know that you know, to fix the engine, you have to go to volume number 10. Same thing. When we say hemophilia gene is sitting in uh, chromosome X, it means that that particular chromosome, that volume of the gene code has this instruction to make factor eight. So we know that it is uh, factor eight. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But yeah, so it, it, we know that uh, the fa factor eight instruction sits in this part of the um, genetic um, book. So going to the next uh, slide, this is where factor eight is made. So here is just a little instruction again. So before this last decade, when I was a medical student, I was told that uh, fact, fact rate is produced in the liver. So I, like uh, um, many people still do believe these days, thinks that the liver cells are actually making fact rate. But one question, which I did not ask at that time is that when people have liver failure, for example, you know, you have taken too much alcohol or you've had hepatitis or somehow you've, you've taken wrong drugs, you, um, you ended up with liver failure, actually fact rate levels don't go down. So fact rate levels actually usually tend to go up in liver failure. But there are many other clotting factors that go down in liver failure. So factor eight is not one of them. So we people actually started questioning where, why, if it's coming from the liver, why is it not the liver, uh, liver cell making it? Turns out that the cells in the liver that actually make most of the fact rate is called a type of cell called the liver sinusoidal endothelial cell or LSEC. So this is not the actual cells that work in your liver. The majority of cells in your liver are called liver cells, but the liver also has certain blood vessels. And some of these blood vessels are called sinusoids. They're called sinusoids because there is a blood pooling in them and there is an exchange of blood in there. And the liver has a lot of blood in there. Um, so this, these sinusoids, the lining of the sinusoids actually has some cells called sinusoidal endo endothelial cells. These are basically um, cells that uh, line up the sinusoids um, they are not the actual liver cells. The liver cells that participate in majority of the protein production in our body, um, they don't make too much fact rate. Most of the fact rate comes from the least in these endothelial cells in the liver. There are also so some other sources of uh, fact rate, such as your blood platelets or the platelet, or the, the, um, the precursors of the platelets called megakaryocytes. We come to that in a second because our gene therapy is uh, um, predicated on that. So it's important to know again that there are only a few cells in the liver basically the, uh, the lining cells of the liver um, blood vessels that actually make most of the fact rate. Once fact rate, uh, so these cells turn on, they look at the chromosome, uh, X chromosome. This, um, they are the people playing that uh, instruction out. Every cell in our body has those instructions, but only the liver endothelial cells choose to take that instruction and carry it out. 
So they carry out the instruction, they make factor eight, and the factor eight gets packaged with another factor called von Willebrand factor. That's coming from the instruction to make that protein comes from chromosome 12, a different man, different volume of the manual. So the gene manual, um, the, the two parts of that gene manual have to collaborate um, in two different types of cells to make the factor eight and von Willebrand factor complex. So von Willebrand factor is very, very important. And again, one of the successes of gene therapy or the failures of gene therapy depends on that. So fa factor eight and von Willebrand factor form a complex. So they're basically a carrier. So it's like, uh, you know, I always say that, you know, in, in, if, you're, if you like chocolate too much and somebody gives you a lot of chocolate, it's a good thing. You think it's a good thing. But, uh, you know, when, when you come to America first or England first from India, in those days, this was like 30 years ago, we did not have such great chocolate in India. So I would take a flight to take this chocolate back home to my parents and my brother and all these family members. So we would put, I would put it in the baggage and the plane would go and the plane would sit in an airport and it gets hot and the chocolate melts and all my clothes, everything has chocolate. So if you don't have one billion factor for factor eight and you start making factor eight, what happens is the factor eight gets into everything. The factor eight gets into the cells. It's not packaged properly. So the most important thing is that the carrier protein is very, very important. Again, when in gene therapy for hemophilia, when we make excess factor eight in some of these cells using gene therapy, Without factor one million factor, we actually get into trouble. That's one of the reasons why the most recent gene therapy trial, uh, which many of you have, may have followed, the Biomarin trial, um, FDA did not approve it because they, they did not think that this was going to be a long-term sustained thing. Um, but I'm confident that it'll get approved in the future. But more, most importantly, it's like having chocolate. Chocolate's a good thing, but unless you package it properly, chocolate can also be a bad thing. Um, so that's the main thing. You have a lot of factor eight, uh, when you have deficient in factor eight, factor eight is important, but also don't forget the carrier protein or one milligram factor protein. So hemophilia A is a situation where factor eight is mis missing. And you may see that factor eight C, factor eight C, the C stands for coagulant activity, or the, that is the final business end of the factor. So the factor is a big protein and not all of the protein is needed for its function. So only a small bit of that protein, that, that uh, reduced truncated protein is called factor eight C. Um, so as we said before. Um, Doctor, sorry to interrupt you. Um, your screen is not being shared anymore. Oh, actually somebody must have, uh, uh, okay, sorry. Um, give me one second. Um, you can see it now? Yeah, this is perfect, sir. Thank you. Perfect, Doctor, we can see. Still working, right? Okay. Okay. So let me. Um, so this is a little basic principle of gene therapy um, as it uh, operates now. This will change in the future, but I'm just going to give what most of the treatments of gene therapy are, um, how how they work. This is just the mechanism of how gene therapy works. So as a patient, you may not need to understand it, but if you're interested, here is how it works. So we our problem going from the top left corner of that slide is to introduce a new gene. Okay, so this is a gene we want to introduce into the human being. So let's say this is the factor eight gene, that little yellow bar, okay? We package that gene into a virus. And again, everybody knows about virus now, right now because of COVID. So viruses are very efficient vehicles to transport genes into our bodies. Every virus that you meet in your life, that virus puts a little bit of its own DNA or RNA, which means the nucleic acid, those instruction manuals. A little bit of the virus's instruction manual gets put into our own cells. So that's, it's always there. It's going to be there forever. Rest of our lives, it'll be there. So viruses are very good uh, at putting the instructions into, into their host, which in this case, human being. So this virus vector, we, what we do, the, the, the tricky part is to put this gene inside this virus. Once the gene is inside the virus's uh, um, nucleic acid. So we make the human gene, the instructions for making human protein we put it into the virus's instruction manual or the virus's genome. We put that, uh, our gene in there. And then we make the virus infect a cell. So if we want to make it, make it happen in the liver, we put it into the liver cell. Uh, and, and that we can do very easily. We inject this virus, this modified virus. This, this is an artificial virus. This is the natural virus is up here. When we put the human gene in there, it becomes an artificially modified virus. And that is the drug. That drug, has to get into the liver of the person. So we can actually give a huge injection to the patient of this virus. So the dose of the virus matters. If you give a big amount, 
a lot of virus will get into the cell. A lot of the virus will actually never get to the liver because we are just injecting into the blood. We can also inject into the liver directly. Some people have tried that, but then it, and then the liver cells actually uh, take up the virus and then the virus gets taken to the nucleus of the liver cell. So that is where the instruction manual for making human protein sits inside that liver, liver cell. And then the virus injects the, its entire genes into that human nucleus and the, the new gene, which is our instruction to make our protein, the protein that we like, that goes into the nucleus of that human being, now the patient, and then it starts making the gene. So this is how it should work, but it's a lot of work to do that. Now here is um, um, how current treatments work versus gene how gene therapy works. So as you can see, sorry, I'm having a lot of uh, um, arrows show up on my screen. It's, uh, I'm not deliberately doing it, sorry. So when you give factor injection to a person with hemophilia, here is what happens. You, your factor level goes up and down, as all of you know, everybody knows. And uh, if you give um, a factor, um, there is a peak and a trough, and we give the next factor, and again, it goes up to a peak. So this, again, depends on the half-life of the factor. We calculate that, and that is the art of being a hemophilia doctor. Now we have extended half-life factors, which, you know, which are um, long half-life. They're artificially modified factor, and they're the... Uh, the troughs are not so bad, uh, but again, and the, it slowly decays over time. So you actually can keep, get away with less injections. You can also have non-factor therapies like, uh, you know, substances that improve blood clotting. Uh, many, of, many people use that when they have uh, milder forms of hemophilia. But when you get gene therapy, you get the steady level of factor, at least over time. Very, very um, important to remember. This is making it all the time. This gene therapy means you, there is no ups and downs. Your factor level is um, absolutely the stable over time, over a long period of time. In fact, the FDA now wants four years of stability before they will even approve it. FDA is the agency that approves all this. And for all companies involved in gene therapy, up their approval is one of the most important things that we need to move forward. So essentially, that is the key of uh, so as a person, if you're a person living with hemophilia, if, you are, if your loved one is, was hemophilia, the most important thing is to have the stability. That gives you the confidence to meet life. So I, my personal story with hemophilia is that many, many years ago, I, um, uh, Jimmy told of my, uh, um, how I became a hematologist. Many years ago, uh, I was actually in Bombay and I was training to become a cardiologist. That's what I thought I would be doing. And my friend uh, who was uh, through me in medical school and uh, my uh, MD, uh, you know, internal medicine training, he actually was a hemophiliac. So I was in charge of helping him whenever he had problems. And for me, the biggest challenge, you know, and I was not a hematologist at that time. So I had to take him in those days to a cryoprecipitate. Uh, and we had to go and get cryoprecipitate and in infuse it into him. He would start bleeding unexpectedly. Factor replacement, prophylactic therapy, none of this was existed in those days. This was in the early 90s. And um, um, we had a lot of trouble. And then um, he one day asked me, you know, you're a smart guy. Why don't you go become a hematologist? You will help a lot more people. So that's one of the things that motivated me. And obviously, I, I, I did not like cardiology. That's why I left. But in any case, this is um, um, uh, the most important thing, I think, was for gene therapy is quality of life. If you're a patient and if you get gene therapy, your um, quality of life changes dramatically. You're not bound to the peaks and trough of your factor. So now let's go into the actual nitty gritty of some of the hemophilia gene therapy. Again, this is an overview. I will give you the specifics a little bit later. So we have two broad ways of doing it. So right in the middle, there is a light bulb and that light bulb is a gene therapy. On the left side, we have in vivo, which means in, inside the living organism. And the other is called ex vivo, which means outside the living organism. So let's look at ex, ex vivo therapy first. Ex vivo therapy is, um, um, means the gene transfer, the transfer of the gene of interest into the uh, cell of interest. So remember, the, the genes are the instructions and you have to put the instruction into a cell. Cell is the, person, the, the element that carries out the instruction. So when you put the gene, the therapeutic gene, in this case, hemophilia gene or factor eight gene, when we put that into a, the cell, outside the body, and then you put the cell into the person, that's ex vivo gene therapy. So for example, the factor eight gene can be packaged into a virus. So we call the virus as the vehicle. So the vehicle carries now the gene of interest, and then we can in, in, introduce that gene into any kind of cell. So there is one type of cell called iPSCs. iPSCs uh, are, stand for induced pluripotent stem cells. So basically we take, take blood or urine 
from a hemophilia patient. We isolate certain cells from their body, and then we can actually culture them. We can actually grow them outside the body in a dish like that. And those cells will grow in. So it's your own cell as a patient, so patient's own cells. And we infect that cell with this virus carrying the gene. So now these cells, the induced pluripotent stem cells, the stem cells of that particular patient carries the factor eight gene. And then we put those cells back into the patient and the cells will go live inside the body of the patient and the cells will make factor eight. So what we have done, we, have, we put the gene into a virus, the virus into the cells that are derived from the patient and the, the cells are then transplanted into the patient. So this is a cell transplant, but it's a modified cell. The other way is the one that we talked about a little earlier. We make the virus and we directly inject the virus into the patient's blood or liver or somewhere. And the hope is that the virus will find its way into the liver and then infect the liver cells inside the body of the patient and the gene therapy happens inside the patient's own body. So this is two broad approaches. Both of them have been tried. Actually, the first ever attempt was this ex vivo therapy. My own treatment uh, protocol uh, uses a type of cell called hematopoietic stem cells. Uh, Dr. Apte and I, we are bone marrow transplanters, and our job is to transplant these cells. We're very good at doing those. So we thought that we can actually do this with hematopoietic stem cells, and I will explain that again a little bit later. So we, exp we explain this ex vivo. We, we make cells, we make infect the cells, and then the cells carry the instructions uh, and the, their, their own bodies back into the patient, and the cells live inside the patient. Um, and now let's go back one step. How do you make a virus? Uh, carry a gene. That's actually a very tricky part. And again, I'm explaining this only because um, many people have this question. So um, the virus that carries the gene of interest. So in this case, a virus which can carry the factor eight gene or factor nine gene um, is called a vector. We call it a vector because the virus is carrying this and it can actually deliver it into the patient uh, in some fashion. So uh, the virus, so this is um, essentially the uh, genes of the virus. And you can actually cut the virus genes wherever you want. Uh, we have very good technologies for that. There are many uh, technologies. One of them is called zinc vinker nucleus. Another one is called talon. There is electroporation. There is many, many techniques. But one of the things that has uh, very much achieved a lot of publicity these days is technique called CRISPR-Cas9. And the people who invented CRISPR-Cas9, um, Jennifer Dutna um, uh, and her team, they won the Nobel Prize for this year for inventing that. So this is the kind of science that actually translates into human beings um, because uh, this invention was made in the last, uh, let's say all the studies involved in that came in the last 15, 20 years. And, uh, uh, and already we are doing trials with using this technology. So this is basic science. What we are doing is technology. We are applying that science to make people's lives better. So science is actually coming from scientists who are one or two grades above us. So this, uh, um, the viral gene is viral, um, in, this is the instruction manual of the virus, okay? This is the viral genome. We cut it where we want and we put our human instruction in there and then the virus then becomes a vector. So we can also use, put some tracker genes in there to see if this whole thing worked, but we put the, this gene, the red bar is the uh, factor eight gene and we put it there and we can make it work. So. And the way of doing it is one of them is called a, um, a plasmid. And this, uh, so if a patient's um, skin cells can be need to be infest, infected, we can make a act artificial um, little bit of DNA called plasmid. We can infect the cell, um, and then the cell can go into the uh, make factor eight, and we can put that into the patient. Um, and then this is the in vivo technique that we talked about. But the problem with the in vivo technique, so we talked about the in vivo technique, which means we take the virus carrying the gene and inject it into the patient. One of the major problems is that our own immune systems don't like viruses. Right now, you know that for COVID, you get immunity. And we use if we use the SARS-CoV-2 virus in patients who have already had COVID, that virus, even if it carries the new genetic material, will not uh, work because our immunity will take the virus out. So that's one issue. But the advantage is that there is no actual transplanting of cells. So you're actually just putting the virus in and the virus goes into the tissues and the tissues will get infected with the virus and then the tissues will start making your gene of interest. It's very cost effective in that it's one step. You make only step is to make the virus and that is the drug for gene therapy. Uh, but uh, ultimately this might be the easier way to do it, but there are currently certain problems with that. Uh, so one of the viruses is retrovirus. You can actually have a retrovirus uh, infect the liver or the stem cells and then use that. 
um, sort of many, many vectors for viruses. So these are um, you know, some of the vectors. Um, one of them is called the MOMLV. Um, so it's, got, uh, it's, a, um, it's a type of a leukemia virus and it can go into the host very quickly and it does not cause immunity, but only, it only works in dividing cells. So many of the cells that make factor eight are not dividing cells. They are just basically stable cells. So that's a problem. Um, the other virus that was very actively pursued a few years ago was adenovirus. It's a very ubiquitous virus. It's very, very common across the world. Um, and these virus, right now, there are some uh, COVID vaccines that are being made with uh, adenovirus, not but human adenovirus, but with chimpanzee adenovirus. That's the famous uh, uh, vaccine that is being this, um, actively debated in India too right now. So th this adenovirus um, can, trans this is a large virus. So that's a big advantage. One of the problems with hemophilia gene therapy is that especially hemophilia A or factor eight gene is a very big gene. It's one of the biggest genes that we have. So that gene is very tough to package into a virus because the virus can only carry a certain load. And the load it can carry depends on the size of the virus gene, genes itself. So it's like, uh, you know, you, or if, you, if your instruction to make hemophilia gene um, protein or factor eight protein is so big, it depends on how big the manual is. You, you have, you're taking out some pages from the virus's manual and putting our pages, human pages in there. That's exactly what we are doing. So unless the, if the manual has a lot of pages, you can do it. If the manual is a small book, we cannot put our big um, chapter in there. So this adenovirus is a um, relatively large virus. So people were very interested in this. Um, but the other problem with adenovirus is it's a very, very common virus. Most people get infected with this in their childhood and many people have immunity against the virus. So this is uh, a problem. And then the other problem is that the genes from the adenovirus do not get fully into the human nucleus. It actually hangs around or outside of the nucleus as a um, body called the episome. So essentially, those are some of the factors with the adenovirus. This virus, adeno-associated virus, is a friend of the adenovirus. Actually, that's why it's called an adeno-associated virus. By itself, it doesn't really cause any problems with humans, but it can. It has the ability to infect humans, and it is um, a. The, it is the single most important virus right now for hemophilia gene therapy. This is where most of the efforts are going. And there are many, many types of this adenovirus. It goes from AAV1 up to 11, and there are there may be new ones coming. <clears throat> there are some advantages in that it can actually go into non-dividing cells. As I told you before, dividing cells are very few in an adult human. So we want the factor eight gene to be expressed in non-dividing cells. So that means this is a good virus for that. The relative problem for this adeno-associated virus is that it has a, it is a small virus. You know, the, the genes of this, own, this virus, it's small, so we cannot put a big instruction manual like factor eight in there. So the first successful gene therapy that was reported by the University College of London group, um, Dr. Nathwani and team, uh, that was a factor nine deficiency uh, situation where they used gene therapy, and that um, basically used the AAV vector. Um, and factor nine is a little bit easier, as I said, because the gene for factor nine is a smaller gene. Factor eight is much more, um, much bigger, but we now have uh, addressed that problem in a different way and we have actually solved it. This is the virus that uh, my team uses called lentivirus. So lentivirus is probably the most commonly used virus in, in most of the cancer gene therapy approaches. So that's why we use this. It, is a, um, um, it has a limited range of targets. It can only get to do a, a few types of cells. Um, and lentivirus is an artificially modified HIV-like virus. One of the things about HIV virus is that it can actually get into certain immune cells very easily, and that's how HIV causes. So basically, we take out um, uh, many elements of the uh, HIV and create this lentivirus, and it has been used in, it is probably the most commonly used in gene therapy across the world right now. And uh, we, so far it has proven to be very, very safe. Um, so this is what we use because our approach depends on infecting the human um, bone marrow stem cells. And this virus is known to infect those very, very easily. Um, there are also non-viral vectors. We saw the plasmids in one of the previous cartoons. Uh, we can also inject direct naked DNA uh, into the person, but that problem is getting it into the um, cells is very difficult. So um, essentially, so we talked about all of this, just to summarize again, for people who are um, not following uh, along, um, the vector can be a virus or a non-viral vector. Non-viral vectors, there are some, we'll come to those in the end because there are some nanoparticles and things like that which are coming along. 
but viruses are the main way of delivering genes into patient cells or their bodies right now. Most important thing to remember. The target cell can be in anything, but the most common target cells for the gene therapies that are used across the world are the liver cells. But we also can use it into the blood cells, such as the bone marrow stem cells um, and certain other types of cells. Um, so we talked about that and we talked about this too. So the stem cell based gene transfer is what, um, what my uh, trial will be and I'll talk about that at the end. Um, so, uh, so this is a, uh, um, just to give you the history of what we have been doing with some retroviral vectors. Uh, so these are some viruses that can integrate into the genome of the human being. So basically when you infect a human cell with the retrovirus, the retrovirus um, will put its um, instruction manual into ours. We cannot distinguish after that. It just goes in there um, and it becomes part of our, our own DNA. So um, with, as I told you before, the factor eight gene is a very big gene. So how people have addressed that problem is that we have deleted, you know, factor eight um, gene has three basic components. Those components are known as A domain, B domain, and C domain. So it turns out that the B domain is not really necessary for its function. So we actually have um, eliminated the B domain for gene therapy purposes. And that particular modified factor eight for gene therapy is known as B domain deleted factor eight. So you, when you read papers and when you read articles, you see that it's a BDD factor eight gene. So B domain deleted factor eight gene is uh, what we all use. Almost everyone uses that. And that is, has been a big improvement in the field so that we don't need a huge virus. We can even use smaller viruses such as AAV to do it. So in this particular uh, um, um, trial, this was a, um, a unsuccessful trial in the early days. And this uh, basically, this method has been abandoned. And then we talked about lentiviruses. We'll go, uh, let, 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 you know, and again, adenovirus can be, we talked about these viruses and adeno associated. So you really need to remember only this virus now, the AAV virus, adeno associated virus. And essentially the main problem was the small gene size, but now, we have actually gone past that problem by using the B domain deleted factor eight. So the first ever trial was a major problem uh, detected and then had to be abandoned. This was, uh, a, the problem was that other cells in our body was also being um, infected with this virus. And if you put uh, genes in cells that are not supposed to express that, then you have major problems. And the problem is the risk of vertical transmissions, for example, if, 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 if a hemophilia patient, their sperms get infected with the virus and they can transmit it to their children, that will not be a good thing. So that had to be abandoned. So now we do, we do what we call liver tropism. So we want these viruses, directly injected viruses, only to go to the liver. So we can enhance that by increasing the affinity of the virus to go to the liver. So that affinity part is called liver tropism. So there are methods of changing that and um, giving that so giving the virus so that it only goes into the liver. So the components of a um, successful gene transfer strategy are the following. So the, the virus that we put, the, the gene that we put artificially into a patient who lacks the uh, gene, is called a trans gene. Uh, if you're missing something and you get it from somewhere else, it's called a trans. Uh, um, so for factor nine, we use the wild type factor nine or the natural factor nine, naturally occurring factor nine. There is a different factor nine called the factor nine Padua. The factor nine Padua is a factor nine that has very significantly higher activity. And that is a naturally occurring, it's, it's, it's not a disease, it's really, a, it, it increases your risk of blood clots if you have that mutation, but it's, it's, in a, it's a naturally occurring mutation in factor nine. And that particular um, factor nine gene can be used because it, it means that even if you infect only a few cells with the virus carrying this factor nine Padua gene, um, the patient will make a good amount because it has a gain of function mutation associated with that. So you can actually use factor nine Padua to actually uh, take advantage of its higher activity uh, so that you get a bigger bang for the buck for your uh, um, treatment of factor nine deficiency. Then comes factor nine, um, a B domain deleted factor eight, which is what um, um, we all use for factor eight gene therapy. And then you need a delivery system. 
So you can actually, the delivery system can be in vivo, means you're infecting cells outside the, uh, cells inside the body. And that for that, we use different types of AAV, adeno-associated virus. That's the small virus I talked about. It belongs to a family of viruses called parvoviruses. It really does not cause any human disease, but it can actually infect the liver and then you can have some changes in liver function and all that with that. And about 30% of people have natural immunity against this virus. That is a problem. So if you have immunity against the virus, the virus will not find it easy to get into the liver. That is an issue. And that issue is a, remains a problem to this day. And that's one of the problems why the FDA is actually very careful about approving these type of treatments. And then we talked about um, um, not infecting sperm or other cells in the body. So we increase the liver tropism. So basically the liver tropism is improved by adding what we call a liver specific promoter so that it actually only discharges its uh, genetic material in the liver. So this is the basic schema of the current major trials. So we'll talk about those trials and I'll go over the trials in a second. So we make the DNA of interest. Here it is B domain deleted factor eight. Then we actually encapsulate that gene inside the adeno associated virus. So AAV carrying the BDD factor eight is this one. We inject that into the patient. There is a dose, that dose depends on number of vector copies. So number of copies of this vector is the dose. And then we, the patient gets infected. Um, in a good way in their liver. And then the target cell, which is the liver cell, starts making factor eight because now this instruction to make protein is inside the liver cell. And this patient who has never made factor eight in their life is starting to make factor eight and that's coming in the blood. Now the, for hemophilia B, these are the two major trials that are going on. So um, factor nine Padua is um, um, packaged into AAV5 and this is going on right now. This is a company called Unicure. Annette von Trigalski is one of our one of my students actually from the past. She's leading that trial, um, and this is uh, factor nine Padua again with a capsid, which is a, a bioengineered particle, and this is a big company Pfizer. We have and this is another trial that's going on. For hemophilia A, there are a whole variety of trials. So the most famous one is uh, led by Dr. John Passy, again, my, one of my professors in England. He actually leads this trial. It's called BMN270. Um, and this is made by a company called Biomarin. They Everybody thought that last month they were going to get approved by the US FDA and this would be an available commercial gene therapy. Unfortunately, the FDA said we need more data. So they're having to wait for at least another year. Um, this is Sangamo Therapeutics. That's another uh, famous uh, company that uses um, AAV2, um, as a, as a even more modified AAV, adeno associated virus. This is Spark Therapeutics. They have a collaboration with a company called Roche, and they have the AAV Spark 200. All of them are B domain deleted factor eights. They're all AAV mediated. The type of AAV is different. Uh, this is Bayer, their factor eight, uh, which is again humanized AAV. Uh, Spark's own trial with um, Spark 200. Uh, this is a variant factor eight that's being developed at St. Jude Children's Hospital and the University College of London. Um, then this is lentivirus based, sorry, uh, a lentivirus based approach with human stem cells, expression therapeutics, they're in phase one. And the one that is circle, circled by um, the red um, circle is my own trial that's called the platelet mute six. So what we do is um, we infect bone marrow stem cells with the lentiviral that carry, lentivirus that carries factor eight, and there are some advantages to that. So think about this for a second. When, you, when a person has never made a factor eight in their life, and they, you get start making factor eight all the time, there is a possibility that you can have inhibitors. So many of these trials exclude patients with pre-existing inhibitors, because the inhibitor may take out the factor eight when it comes out. There is also a possibility that the fact rate may not get taken out by constant production. You are actually overwhelming the immunity and you might actually have Im immune uh, inhibitors go away. So this is a theoretical problem and may also become a practical problem. So this is something that people have to, uh, people are worried about. And so our approach and some of these approaches using human stem cells, um, they go bypass the problem of immunity. So uh, my trial is only for patients who have inhibitors. So that's, uh, we, we don't, you know, if you don't have inhibitors, we don't want you in our trial. Um, because we think we should go, you should go to some other trial. So this is the Biomarin BMN270 trial. So again, um, it is the same approach. I don't know, associated five is the virus, B domain deleted factor eight is the, the gene that is interested and it goes into the um, DNA of the nucleus, into the nucleus and there the DNA that we put in the patient 
becomes a little uh, cir circular DNA piece called episome, and that remains outside the nucleus and it starts making protein. So this is called, uh, this is how the virus looks, this part, the ITR and this part, this, this part is a human factor eight part. And as you can see, the B domain is deleted out. It's only A1, A2, A3, and C1, C2. And there are some uh, sequences we, that we put in behind and after that is to stimulate um, uh, transcription. So basically to promote the gene to be expressed. Um, so here is the data that will be very interesting to you all. So the, this is factor eight level um, activity. So just look at the patients who got the higher dose, the six um, raised to 13 vector grams per kilogram dose. So, um, so this is the, the level of factor eight going by the weeks of uh, how many weeks after that they had. So this is going all the way to 208 weeks. So that's almost um, um, four years, coming up on four years. So you can see that the fact rate activity level was pretty high at the beginning, and then that kind of stabilized. And even at four years, the level is around 25% or 25. So this is really, really good. But then the people who are against gene therapy or the people who are actually skeptical about gene therapy in a scientific way, they would say that, see, we don't know the, we don't know the long-term success. You are only prone up to the, in the fourth year, you have shown that patients an average level of 25% activity. So, and it's, it was almost 100% when you first started, but then it dropped to 25. Now we all know that 25 is actually a pretty good level um, and it prevents bleeding and you don't, your hemophilia phenotype has changed at that level from a severe hemophiliac to a, um, a he mild hemophiliac or even no um, uh, spontaneous bleeding level. Um, but the FDA wanted more data. So they actually asked the company to wait for even beyond four years to show. This is even, even more important. So then this trial, um, the annual factor eight usage coming in to the trial was over here. You can see that literally every single patient is using a lot of factor eight. And after that, the use is pretty much minimal. There are two patients at this high dose level uh, that used it. And at the lower dose level, again, there's about one or two patients who get that. So factor eight uh, ranges over here. And again, the, um, the, um, and the annual bleeding rate, um, except for two, every patient had a lot of bleeding and that's also gone away. There was only one patient who had ble bled after week five. So essentially the factor use, bleeding, quality of life, everything has improved in, by patients who were doing that. So the safety remains fantastic. Uh, adverse events. This is what, what bad things can happen. So what is one, one thing is, you know, when you get the virus, you get that infusion of virus, somebody's injecting a virus into your body, you can get infusion reactions like a fever or some flushing or, you know, feeling hot, etc. So that is considered transient. It comes and goes and you, you're not even staying in hospital for that. Um, the second thing is you, we monitor the liver function. So we are actually introducing an infection to the liver. Sometimes when the virus starts making protein in the liver, our immune system can go and kill the liver. Um, basically, it, those liver cells that are making new protein will be detected as foreign by our immune system and they might actually attack it. Our own immune system might take out those cells because it, 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 our immune systems are primed to defend us from the threat of making you know, abnormal protein. So that's why we don't get cancer all the time. And that, that's why we recover from COVID and all that. So that immune system can take out the um, liver cells and that can cause liver function abnormalities. And that is, can be treated with steroids or sometimes you just observe them and it can go away. Um, so that is a, um, something that people have watched, but so far no big problems. And uh, treatment related serious adverse events, essentially nothing. No participants withdrew from the trial. Nobody has had any trouble from using steroids to treat this liver um, abnormalities. No thrombotic events means nobody had clotting problems and no one developed factor eight inhibitors. And these are all inhibitor pre-patients coming in. These people could not have inhibitor and join the trial. So that's one issue, uh, but still patients, uh, nobody has developed inhibitors after that. This is another trial, the SPARC uh, therapeutics trial, SPARC 80011. And again, they have 14 patients. And essentially um, at lower levels, they had some patients who lost expression, it means that they got the uh, gene induced. They, the, the, they started making, patients started making factor eight, but then 
they lost expression. That means the fact rate making cells st either stopped making fact rate or those cells were taken out by the immune system of the patient. So that means it didn't work for those patients long term. And again, that's one of the reasons why this long term is an issue to think about. Um, this is the Bayer trial, Bay 2599. Again, fact rate, as you can see, the uh, it starts at a low level and keeps going up. As you can see, almost everyone at, at the level of uh, the, at the dose step one has at least 10%. And then as a higher dose, you, you are actually getting activity up to like 80%. So uh, this, is, this is probably going to be their full dose. And they have now 16 months follow-up and no evidence of loss of expression. So that means fact, it, once the patient started making fact rate, they are continuously making fact rate and no, at 16 months, nobody has lost uh, it. So some of the issues uh, with the AAV type approaches. So this is the most dominant approach. So this, these people, we are all in competition to make a good treatment for patients. Um, but this is the approach that seems to be working um, 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 or uh, the most commonly adopted. So there is some variability uh, depending on dosage and how much fact rate is being made. The durability, how long this can go on, whether it's a permanent cure or not, that is up in the air. We don't know that. Reliability seems to be very good. Safety, I told you that uh, enzyme elevation could be a problem. Um, um, and that has to be treated with steroids. And that might actually also correlate with lack of uh, you know, durable uh, response over time. It might go away because it, uh, if there is an infection happening and the viral infected cells are being taken out by your immune system, then that means the fact rate level can go down because then the cells that are making fact rate might be the ones that are problem. And then you have the same problem that we have uh, with, uh, remember I told you the story of chocolate. So if your liver cell, which has never made fact rate before, starts making fact rate, remember there is no one millimeter factor. So there is no packaging for the chocolate so that it is getting stuck in the liver. So in the liver cell, the fact rate can get misfolded because it is not um, um, associated with the wrapper, which is one millimeter factor. So no wrapper, the chocolate gets misfolded and it gets stuck in the liver and cannot come out. And that can lead to a deposition of misfolded protein in the liver and can also lead to dysfunction. So that is one of the things that is uh, was considered theoretically, and now it's becoming a little bit of a bigger problem in the long term. That's another reason why the durability is a question these days. Um, but again, if you can get 25% for the rest of your life, you've actually changed from a severe hemophiliac to not even worrying about hemophilia all the time. Um, then the other thing that is, again, more theoretical is insertional mutagenesis. When you put a new gene into a person who has never had that gene, we wonder that if the disruption of their genetic material can lead to cancer. So that's called insertional mutagenesis. So this is very closely monitored. Every patient who undergoes gene therapy of any form anywhere in the US, we have to check, check them for cancer for 15 years. So far, we haven't found any signal for that. So all of the people in the field, we are actually pretty good about this. Um, and then we already talked about patients who have antibodies against AAV cannot get this, and then they may not have effective therapy. Children, we don't have data and then repeat dosing. That means if the fact rate levels drop, can you give another injection of the same gene therapy and succeed? We don't know that. Um, so in the patient angle, the good things, the, it may need eliminate the need for factors, eliminate spontaneous bleeds for sure. Quality of life will definitely improve in my opinion. The scope, this might be the best treatment for a country that cannot afford a lot of factor. You, it's one and done. You know, it might be you do it once, you may not have to do it again. So I think in countries that don't have resources to care for all of their hemophiliacs, this is the better way to go. And the future approaches, we may have to do some immune suppression. We may have to do more gene editing, et cetera. Um, and then these are some of the vehicles. You can improve the vehicles. You can improve. Actually, you, don't, you may not need viruses in the future. There are things called lipid nanoparticles, which can directly get, to, get into the nucleus. You actually have to make the virus first, and then you have to transfer the gene from the virus into these nanoparticles, uh, and you can in inject those, then the, the problem of immunity against the virus is gone. Um, so these are some of these technologies, you know, nanoparticles, lentivirus, editing, et cetera. Um, question is, we actually don't know if it's a cure or not because we don't have that long-term follow-up. Now let's go to, um, uh, so this is again, you know, the CRISPR technology that we just talked about and the people who won the Nobel prize and all that. CRISPR is a very uh, highly refined way of editing uh, genes. Um, and that is probably going to be the winning technology in the future. So everybody knows, talks about CRISPR. So if your friends ask you, you can tell I know all about CRISPR because CRISPR is a system derived from bacteria and it is a system for guiding 
the exact spot at which you want to affect a change in the gene and you CRISPR edited genes are actually very finely edited better than what we can do with viruses or other technologies. Um, so this is the nanoparticle technology. So you can use the AAV and then you create a nanoparticle, which basically is a um, little fat globule, tiny, tiny, tiny flat, fat globule that contains the gene of interest and it can be injected into the patient. It can go to the area of interest. So this is our own clinical trial, which is a completely different way of doing gene therapy. I can tell you about that in a few seconds while, that we have remaining. So, uh, so this is the Medical College of Wisconsin approach. This technique was uh, essentially discovered and or invented by my friend, uh, Dr. Wilcox, who and I collaborate with him. And the two of us have a, a grant from the FDA and the US National Institutes of Health to do this clinical trial here. Um, and we um, so we are almost uh, we have it open right now. So you know because of COVID and all that, we didn't actually get a patient yet. We just started it. Uh, so um, essentially, our approach is to use a virus called the lentivirus, which carries the B domain deleted factor eight, and we infect the patient's own bone marrow stem cells. So our bone marrow is where most of our all of our blood is made actually. Um, so and the bone marrow has some mother cells called the stem cells. So it turns out that if you can take stem cells out of a patient and if you can and then if the patient's bone marrow gets destroyed, you can put those stem cells back into the patient and then the pa patient's bone marrow will come back to life. So that's what Dr. Apte and I do day-to-day uh, -day life. We, we, when patients have cancer, we take their stem cells out, we freeze those stem cells, then we give the cancer patient a big dose of chemotherapy. The big dose of chemotherapy will kill both the cancer and their bone marrow because the bone marrow killing is a side effect of the big dose of chemotherapy. And then we use those frozen stem cells from the patient. We put it back into the patient and the patient will come back. The bone marrow will come back in about 10, 14 days. So this is called an auto transplant. So we are using this approach for hemophilia in that we take stem cells from the patient with, the, with hemophilia. It is collected from your blood. And then in, in the lab, we actually infect those stem cells that we have taken out with this lentivirus uh, carrying the hemophilia gene. So now the bone marrow stem cells actually can make, the, uh, they have the instruction to make fat rate. So that's a very big deal. And normally bone marrow stem cells make only a tiny bit of fat rate. Uh, we actually put a new promoter in there, which is a um, uh, basically like, like an on switch for the gene. So we actually make those, we tell the bone marrow stem cells, here's how you make factor eight, and now you are going to make factor eight. So we actually have modified the bone marrow stem cells, not just to give the ability to make factor eight, but also a specific instruction, keep making it. And the good news is that in the bone marrow stem cells, factor eight is actually made along with one millibrand factor. So one millibrand factor is also made by a cell in your body that comes from the bone marrow called the platelet. So what happens is the factor eight and one millibrand factor are manufactured together in the bone marrow stem cells and it comes out and it gets packaged in a tiny particle called the platelet alpha particle. So now we have alpha particles in the bone that comes out of the bone marrow stem cells that make platelets. So when we transplant the new, uh, the, the patient with these modified stem cells from their own body, now it, with the ability to make factor eight um, um, and package it in an alpha particle, what happens is the blood vessels of the patient is teeming with now factor eight containing little particles. The good news is when, since inside they are inside the platelets, the inhibitor will not work against them. So even if you have inhibitors, our technology will work. And when you have an injury, so here is a injury site, those platelets will go there and they will release the factor eight at the site of injury. So since factor eight is not in circulation, uh, the, the inhibitor will not work. You will not develop new inhibitors and uh, factor eight is released only at the sites of injury. So how do we know that this works? It all seems great in theory. So here is the, another way of talk, thinking about this technology. We take human stem cells. We actually um, uh, infect that with fact, fact rate containing lentivirus. And after we transplant it into the human being, we actually have megakaryocytes. These are the cells in the body that come from the stem cells and make platelets. And those megakaryocytes have made platelets now and the platelets are active, uh, are uh, carrying factor eight. So you have a, so instead of making factor eight in the blood, we are actually making factor eight inside a particle inside the blood. So basically you don't need that much factor eight and it's only released at the time of injury. So how do we do that? We have several dogs that we treated. So we have what we call 
inhibitor um, fact rate inhibitor models. So this dog is a hemophiliac dog with inhibitors. So we actually transplanted him many years ago. Um, and this is how the transplant happened. So we are collecting stem cells from the dog. Um, then we are actually uh, making the dog stem cells, uh, give the, giving them in instruction to make fact rate. So the lentiviral transduction process is happening in that uh, black and white picture. And then the transduction has already happened. Um, then we give the dog a little bit of chemotherapy so that they accept those stem cells. So dog is getting chemotherapy here. And then we are actually giving a little bit of immune suppression for the dog. We actually don't do that for humans, only for dogs. And now once we have the dog, the, so dog is now completed transplant. And we are looking at the dog's platelets here. As you can see, that's a confocal microscopy that looks for uh, fact rate levels in the, uh, inside the blood. We can see that there is fact rate inside the granules of those little particles there. Um, here is the fact rate. The first one was fibrinogen. And now we have a merge picture. You can see that fact rate is uh, along with fibrinogen and other clotting factors is inside the blood, inside the platelets of the dog. And these are, this is what happened to three of our dogs. You can see that uh, these dogs did very well. They, uh, uh, and then after the transplant, the inhibitor went away. These, all of these dogs, remember, they had inhibitors. So the inhibitor went away because the dog is not getting any more injections of factory. So the inhibitors spontaneously went away over time. And we have now dog follow up for almost uh, seven years. Uh, and these dogs, their bleeding rate essentially went from um, multiple episodes of bleeding to zero without any factor supplementation. And this is one of the dogs, as you can see, this dog here is when the dog got treated with the fact rate. Um, and you can see that the platelet fact rate. So platelets normally do not have fact rate. So the, at baseline, uh, the, the dog does not have any fact rate. It went up to about 10% and it is remaining at 10%. So the thing is, if it's inside the platelet, you don't need to go to 20% or 25%. You just need to find it in the platelets, that's it. Um, and the platelet will, the, the function of the platelet in the human body is to stop bleeding. So whenever there is a bleeding area, the platelet will go there and deliver the fact rate at the site of bleeding. So you don't need to have fact rate running around in your blood. So our, between the three dogs, we've only had two major bleeding episodes in the, in the seven years of follow-up. So what's happened is that one dog, his friend dog bit, bit him in the eye and the dog had to um, get some fact rate. At that time, we gave the dog some fact rate to prevent him from bleeding. Another dog, the dog bit his tongue when he was eating. And in dogs, biting of tongue, hemophilic dogs especially, biting of tongue can, dog, uh, tongue can be a serious situation because the dog can bleed and choke. So we actually gave him prophylactic fact rate at that time. So, so the only time, two times in these years where the dogs needed fact rate. Otherwise, the dog ran around and was very happy and we just followed the dog. Um, so this is basically preclinically we proved that and with only about even two to four percent gene marking we have uh, at least five units in the platelets uh, in, 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 in about uh, 10 to the eight platelets we have five units that's it because uh, there are millions of actually billions of platelets in the body that's a very good number and that essentially stops bleeding so we have now up at least six years of follow-up in the youngest dog and no anti inhibitors, inhibitors have completely disappeared. And this is 20 years of work, work over here. I came here in 2002 um, and uh, we have done it in mice. We have done it in human cells. We have done it in dogs. We now know that targeting fact rate to platelets is a feasible strategy. And we call it ectopic production of fact rate because normally uh, most of the fact rate is made in the liver endothelial cells. Now we are making it in a different cell called the um, bone marrow stem cell and the megakaryocyte. So this is our treatment schema. If a patient comes to us today, we actually have them sign consent. We tell them this is what can happen. You know, you might have to have, you need chemotherapy to do this and all that. Um, so basically we collect stem cells six weeks prior to transplant and we store them. So that's a backup product. If something doesn't go well, we can use that as a backup. So we have to use that, keep that as a backup. Then about um, three or four, uh, actually a couple of weeks before their um, actual treatment, they come, we collect more stem cells. And in those, those, for those cells, we select out the uh, bone marrow stem cells called CD34 cells, and we infect them with the lentivirus, which carries the fact rate gene. And then we test that product to make sure that uh, meets, meets our quality control. And then we give them what we call submyeloblative conditioning. So it means um, a tiny bit of chemotherapy. It's not a huge dose of chemotherapy. For cancer patients, we usually give 200 milligrams 
for hemophilia, we are only giving 120 milligrams. And this is a drug that, again, is a chemo drug, but it also, it, it is mainly given for to suppress the immune system so that these cells are accepted. Um, and we don't expect any major complications from this chemotherapy because it's actually a very um, um, limited dose and a one-time dose. Um, and in, if a patient gets cancer, they are taking this type of treatment for many times. Uh, so then we um, give them the cells and after about 14 days, these cells have been grafted, um, means the cells are working and the factor rate is starting to be produced and we expect this to work just as well as, as it worked in the, uh, in the dogs. So this is a completely different and a outside the box approach. So we hope that that will work. And after transplant, we follow up the patients for at least 15 years. Um, we expect the inhibitors to disappear. So this trial is only for inhibitor patients and not for patients who don't have inhibitors. So we actually want to find a solution for inhibitor patients. And if it works in inhibitor patients, we also know that it will work in patients who have no inhibitors. So many, many approaches, many, many commercial trials. The disappointing aspect was that the BMN270 FDA did not approve last month, and it's a little disappointing, but I'm still hopeful that they will get approved um, ahead of us and other people. That's actually good for patients. But remember, that's only for patients who don't have inhibitors at this time. And also, the, um, it, it may not work in everybody. So we want new approaches and multiple different approaches have to compete. So this is uh, uh, all I have. Thank you, doctor, for a wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, we have some questions. Actually, most of the, the questions were um, inhibitor related, which you have answered. Just a minute. And at the same time, there is one question which is very common in India right now about the cost of having this done in India. And though your presentation was wonderful, we have lots of questions regarding the cost and. I don't know. I, I when I went through uh, UPAN and I asked the question to a few of the doctors there, that Dr. Adam Sucre and all, it was told to me that you know it's around three million US dollars. I know. And it comes to almost around twenty to twenty-three crore Indian rupees. So, do would you like to put some light on this, sir? Please. Yeah. So, yeah. So I have some people have actually directly asked questions. So one one question is: Is person having fatty liver a good person for gene therapy? So that's one of the problems. I actually um, thank uh, Dr. Brar for bringing it up. So if you have pre-existing liver damage from either fatty liver or hepatitis, uh, those patients are actually excluded from the uh, liver-directed adeno-associated virus and all those approaches. So that's one other group that cannot get it. But for our technique with the marrow stem cells, it's, uh, it is. Uh, it's okay. We can do that. So the actual cost of doing uh, treatment is not... Two, two or three million US dollars. That is not it. Um, when we have big commercial players, they actually have invested a lot of money into this and they want to recoup their money and that's how it is. Uh, Dr. Apte and others know that we, I have a different approach for uh, cancer gene therapy uh, where we actually make the same gene therapy that it sells for about half a million dollars called CAR T cells. We have that uh, uh, sold in the US for about half a million dollars. Uh, that was a technology that came out of UPenn originally. And now we do that in our center for about... 40,000 US dollars. So we can actually reduce the cost. And unless, you know, I firmly, firmly believe that unless the cost can be reduced, it is not even effective for patients. You know, what's the point of having that something that nobody can aspire? You know, uh, our president got like, a, you know, ex ex extraordinary treatment for uh, COVID, but normal people cannot get it. So that's, that's the problem. You know, we want everyone to benefit from science. Otherwise, there is no point. So I, I think, so for, for uh, our Treatment again, there is no, um, uh, it is significantly cheap because you can do an auto transplant in India. I think Dr. Apte and his group charges in uh, five to 10 lakh rupees, right, Dr. Apte? Yes, the cost of auto liver transplant would be around 10 lakh rupees. 10 lakh rupees in India. Um, and that plus the lentil vector and all that uh, will cost something more than that. Uh, let's, but it is not going to be crores of rupees, no. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Natu, uh, make you. the questions, please. Natu, Prem, and Jimmy, please take it forward. For the, uh, there are lots of questions. So, um, there's you. quite a few questions, doctor. So, the, the one question is um, factor 8, factor 9. Which do you think is more successful in gene therapy? So, right now, the most of the success has been with factor 9, as you know. Uh, mainly because uh, factor 9, uh, uh, you know, that is an easier thing to do because it's a um, lower, um, uh, smaller-sized gene. Um, and 
if, uh, we also have the factor nine Padua, which for most of people, and that's inadvertently discovered, you know, uh, factor that actually has a lot of gain of function. So it's easier to do, and it is um, much more um, tolerable for the patient. So that's, and the inhibitor rate, you know, for fa fa factor eight, the likelihood of inhibitors is very, very high. For factor nine, that's not, that's not the case. So it, from multiple angles, factor nine is an easier target. Uh, but factor eight is where the action is, where the real money is. You know, it's like climbing Mount Everest versus climbing a smaller mountain. <laughs> Thank you, doctor. So um, uh, this, you have explained this, but little further more light on it. Uh, gene therapy, is it a permanent solution or will it just last for a few years? And this is a question. Yeah, so we don't have the answer to that. That's what the FDA also, um, you know, uh, keeps um, keeps going back to. So when they are, so the FDA really sh sh is not concerned about the cost. At least technically, they are not concerned about the cost. So there, but the big argument that people make is that if it only lasts five or six years, why would uh, why would you spend two or three million dollars for that? Uh, and if it only lasts a limited number of years, can you redo it? So those two questions also need to be answered in the same context. So the, that's why this um, you know the a stem cell based approach it is. Uh, infinitely renewable because you, you know for our uh, type of approach you can actually give the stem cells again and again um, and you don't need chemotherapy each time you can boost the stem cells whereas with the liver directed approach if you develop immunity or if you deliver di dis liver dysfunction that may be a problem so that's one of the other questions that they have, it's be before everyone's mind in our approach we know that at least one uh, one of the dogs has now passed away of old age so that dog lived to age 14 and then died of old age until the day he died, he did not have any um, um, any bleeding at all. Wow. Uh, what are the side effects of gene therapy? This is one of the questions which have repeatedly been asked. So, um, you know, so let's go to the liver-directed gene therapies. So there are no major side effects, as, as we said. The major, the most important side effect is that it may not work and it may not... Uh, it, um, it, it may not last. So those are the two big things when you consider uh, that. But the common thing, the commonest side effect is you give a big load of virus, you can get a like a fever or a fever illness. That's we called a, a infusion related reaction. So we're giving a foreign substance into the person's body. They, they, they might have like an allergy or an infusion reaction. The second thing is that once the liver has been infected, you're, you, we can get what we call a, a hepatitis, a liver infection. So that liver infection um, we basically monitor with a test called um, AST, ALT, or SGOT, SGPT, more commonly known in India that way. Um, and we call it in America, we call it a transaminitis. Those enzymes are called transaminases, and those uh, en en enzyme levels can go up. So we call it a sign of liver inflammation. And when that liver inflammation happens, then um, you know we, patients may need to get some steroids. So far, that has not been a big problem. But again, remember, all of these trials have involved very small number of patients, 15, 20 type patients. So these are the patients that have been closely observed. And those patients, um, for them, some of them, they've received steroids with no major other toxicity. So compared to the old days of gene therapy, modern gene therapy has been very dramatically successful. So two uh, questions, I'll mix it together. It's for Apte sir and uh, Hari sir. The question is uh, where we can get this treatment in India. And the next question is uh, that what are the biggest medical problems of non-viral vectors? Um, non-viral non vectors uh, basically are a couple of different ones, you know, a direct injection of plasmids, lipid nanoparticles, etc. And non-viral vectors are really not mainstream right now. So they are actually more research-based approaches at this point, you know, even more research, -based. everything is research-based right now, but uh, non-viral vectors may be in the future, but not really up there right now. And, and viral vectors are the most effective ve vehicles to deliver these right now. And that's the thing. So another, the non-viral vector approach with, for example, if we just do CRISPR-Cas editing of a, cell in the patients, you know, we take out cells and do CRISPR-Cas9 based editing, put the gene we want back in and put it into the patient, then you've actually done a non-viral method. Uh, and, and that is coming, but it's not like mainstream right now. But the bigger advantage is that these non-viral methods are a little bit more precise uh, if you do CRISPR-Cas9. And if, it, if you do some other things like lipid nanoparticles, etc., there is no infectivity 
Um, and that lack of infectivity is an advantage, lack of pre-existing, um, you know, if you have adenoir associated virus in the past, uh, normally if you have been infected by that virus in the past and you have antibodies against it, then it will not work. So it may be more applicable to patients and it may actually um, be able to be done with less side effects. Uh, but again, you know, remember the side effects are not the big problem right now. Thank you, sir. Uh, Sashi, sir, uh, if you can say that uh, where is available in India, See, the autologous transplants are done at more than 70, 75 centers. What Dr. Hari just showed is the gene editing and transferring the factor eight gene with lentivirus to the stem cells. That is the real story. Because now autologous transplant programs are very well established in the country. Correct. Very well established in the country. And to let me tell you, the death rate is very, very low. Death rate of autologous transplant for malignancy is also very, very low. And here the chemotherapy is a very low-dose chemotherapy, which is called as a non myeloablative chemotherapy. So once, if we can have the access to the gene and tag it to the stem cell, doing the autologous transplant is not a, a very difficult thing at all. The crux is to get the modified gene and modified stem cells. That is the real uh, trick, which we have to do right now I don't think any center in the country right now is doing that. Thank you, sir. Sir, next question for Hari, sir, is uh, please clarify the concept of SCAAV. Any role for sensitization to prevent anti-vector immunity in liver directed gene therapy? Should gene therapy be repeated in adulthood? Um, so I, I think I understand the question. Um, uh, so um, uh, so the question is the questioner is really asking if there is a role for sensitization, um, meaning um, for inhibitor um, or in inducing tolerance to the inhibitor, so that if they yes, need sir. inhibitor. Yeah. Sir. yeah. So if you have any, so essentially, so the situation is this: patients with inhibitor, they really don't want the, the those patients to enter trials right now. Uh, but because the big worry is that the inhibitor will immediately take out the factor eight as it comes out and the gene therapy will fail. So that is a question. So for an inhibitor patient to get the liver directed gene therapy, will, will, will that be possible or not? We, we actually don't have the answer. Um, and again, if you have undergone successful immune tolerance and say you're on something like hemilibra, which is uh, the monoclonal antibody against it, I, um, and which can bypass um, um, the inhibitor, and you've been on it for a few years and you don't have a um, um, significant detectable level of uh, inhibitor, then you might be able to do this. Um, and, but the problem is that unless we do the trial, we don't know, because what, what it tells us about your immune system when you have inhibitor is that when you make factor eight, your body is going to react to it. And that when we the big question is if you are an inhibitor patient in the past and you do liver directed gene therapy and the liver cells make factor eight, will it lead to more hepatitis, uh, immune hepatitis, um, and those kind of things? We don't have the answer, so that's that's why it is a little bit tricky, and that's why these trials right now exclude. But sensitization is the way to go, and to stay without um, inhibitors is the way to get onto these trials. Uh, or you can think of a trial like ours where there is uh, in inhibitor patients are what we want. So uh, we went for this particular group of patients because we think that is the most unmet need in hemophilia. If you are, as, as all of you on this call know, if you are an inhibitor patient and you have a huge cost, even here, the, the cost of, for example, hemilibra is very, very high. So it's, it's really a big unmet challenge. We thought that if we're going to go after this, we should go after the most vulnerable population. That's why we went for that. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, next question is from a person you know him well, I guess. His name is Murali from Chicago. And it seems like he told me that he works with you or worked with you once, I guess. So his question yeah. is, is someone with other comorbidities as a candidate for gene trial, for example, transplant or heart disease? Um, that depends on the individual trial. Um, is, for example, our trial does not exclude someone with heart disease. You know, it depends on what the heart disease. If you have like a, had a, 
a stent in the heart, for example, that will not be excluded uh, for, from, for our trial. So it depends a little bit on each trial, how each trial is designed. If you have a, um, you know, so that, um, because we are not giving a huge dose of chemo or anything, so we are actually happy to take patients as long as they have good function. Um, uh, whereas uh, for the biomarin trial, for example, it's a much more, it's a commercially run trial. The company does not want to lose any money. So the gate is very, very narrow there because you, they want the best of the best patients. And that is actually seen in any clinical trial anywhere in the world for any disease. So the clinical trial patients are highly selected. Uh, but you know, it actually depends on your personal situation. For example, diabetes will not be a problem for us. Um, and, and, um, but with renal failure or kidney failure, if you're on dialysis, we will not be able to do this. Thank you, sir. Prem, uh, Nataraj, check the question box, please. And from uh, Facebook yeah. and well, there's YouTube. one question from Mr. Kuroki. So how much time will it take for a patient to get this done? Could this gene therapy, how much time does it take? Um, so, um, so, so, so let's say if it's adenovirus gene therapy, um, and you say, okay, tomorrow we have a trial, say we have a trial in Mumbai, or you are here in, um, you know, in a center, you know, you're in London uh, at Royal Free, where the, the, most of the patients were treated. You go there and you sign up for the hemoph hemophilia gene therapy. Right now it's a clinical trial protocol. They do some pre-testing to, they, they check you for inhibitor, they check you for viruses, they check you for antibodies against the adenovirus, adeno-associated virus, and they ensure that your liver function is good. You have an ultrasound of the liver, all that. And then they say, okay, we will do the gene therapy on such and such day. And on the day you go there and you get an injection of the vector, uh, which contains the virus with the gene. Uh, for our trial, uh, you, you, you come here. We actually, our trial is probably the most complicated in terms of how much um, prep, prep you need. If you come to, um, so if we, we actually will take an, at least one, or one international patient at some point, because I, I really want to do it. And it's, we, we can actually even cover some travel costs and all that but we want to do it in the US patients first before we do it in an international patient. Um, so what happens is uh, you come here, we actually collect your stem cells, then you have to wait for six weeks and then we collect one more time. And that with, from there, the train has started. So you collect and in about a week and a half, you're getting your uh, gene therapy and another two weeks later, you're recovered and your, your platelet should be having factor eight and you don't take any more factor after that. So, that, so that's, uh, so it, it, let's say it takes about, um, uh, one month in the second end and six weeks. So it's almost about 10 weeks to 12 weeks. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Question about uh, VWOD patients and gene therapy. Does it work on VWOD? Yeah, so VWOD is a much more complicated disease um, and it's not a straightforward single gene disease, as you know, um, because uh, VWD is a panoply of many diseases. So that's why we really don't have any exciting um, trials for VWD right now. Excellent, sir. Is uh, there a cost difference between um, uh, factor eight and factor nine gene therapy and which one costs less? And, uh, uh, connect, I mean, the, and is surgery possible during a trial? These are the questions, sir. Um, so those are, uh, so the, the, the cost, basically trials are all free. So if you can join a trial, that is free. Uh, if, so if you can travel to a place where there's a trial and they take you on, that gene therapy is free at that point. Right now, so literally every gene therapy is free. But when the uh, factor nine and or factor eight commercial product comes out, if it's a company like big company like Pfizer or Biomarin or Roche that's manufacturing it, I don't think there'll be a difference between factor eight or factor nine. So, you know, factor nine probably will cost just the same as factor eight. And because it's not driven by, um, you know, um, th their consideration is only how much um, they, they should charge for it based on how much benefit the patient gains, et cetera. Now, uh, the, um, uh, the other question was, uh, what was the other question? Sorry. Surgery on the, the Surgery during... On. So during... Yeah. So the once obviously it's not it is not advisable to do it till you know that the factor eight levels have gone up, but many patients who've had um, um, gene therapy have survived, um, you know, road traffic accidents, uh, stabbing attempts, and all sorts of other things uh, without having need for factor. Um, so that way surgery is also possible during gene therapy. Remember the, the, the liver directed one is like literally one day, right? And after that you wait for the factor eight and that week six, you already have factor eight. 
um, significant levels of fat rate come in your circulation. So you, you can do surgery then. So that's, you know. Thank you, sir. So the next question is, how many days follow-up is required after gene therapy? And after how many days of gene therapy, we can uh, get back to normal work life? So again, for the liver-directed gene therapy, you don't even need to interrupt your work for even a day. For, for our type of approach, where it's a stem cell-based approach, uh, you will probably be off of work for two months. Um, follow-up is lifelong, actually, because gene therapy patients are being followed forever. For our trial, the first one year, you probably have to come here once a month or once in two months. And then after that, once a year for up to 15 years. You know, if we don't see you, we'll have to have somebody see you and send us the blood because we are monitoring your blood for various complicated things after that. We are looking for the gene inserted in some other areas. We are looking for cancer. We are looking for, you know, many, many things. So, and uh, gene therapy and pediatrics, if, and what age is it um, uh, advised? So right now, the trials are generally uh, meant to, most of the trials are excluding children. And uh, that is, again, an FDA safety thing. There are some trials like the St. Jude Children's Trial, which are actually basically for children. But other trials exclude children. So um, again, it, 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 we have to prove safety in adults before we go to children. So that's why it's excluded. So we really cannot give an answer for that. So ma major thing is that the children's trials, are, are children are excluded from this trial. And that the, even when the, the children are included, they are only included about 14 years or so. so there's a factor one patient who um, uh, wants to know whether gene therapy is uh, there in factor one. Uh, factor one. No, I don't think so, Hari. Yeah. I don't think so. I agree. A, a person who is on uh, Himlebra trial and consequently has low levels of inhibitor, can he be a candidate for gene therapy trial? Uh, technically, yes. Um, so um, definitely, um, in, in, for our trial, yes. You know, if you wanted to do this, we are 100% um, you know, for it. Um, for the biomarin, I don't know uh, because uh, I haven't read the protocol recently. So um, it, it, they may exclude patients with a history of inhibitors too, high titer inhibitors. The, the history of high titer inhibitors is what I would expect in that patient and that might be an issue. Thank you, sir. There's another question. Uh, is there is a difference of cost in factor eight and factor nine or it can be same? No, I think commercially when it gets approved. So right now it's all free. All gene therapy is free because it's trial. Trial means trial protocols free. Um, for example, if you come here and you can get into our gene therapy trial, we don't. We actually don't even charge a penny for anything, uh, and that's that's a requirement because the trial. We don't know the benefit. We are not promising anything. We are actually asking you to participate in an experiment, so it's free. Uh, whereas when it becomes commercially available, the first one will be a, a, from a big company. There will not be any difference, in my opinion, between factor eight and factor nine. Thank you, sir. Uh, just a clarification, sir, from, uh, uh, it's a question rather in, in a clarification form. The person who underwent a successful gene therapy would still pass on the original mutated gene to his children? Um, yes. Uh, yes, because uh, gene, gene therapy only fixes the production problem in the body. It does not fix the um, genes in your, um, you know, in your uh, uh, sperm cells, for example. So that that is true, yeah. And that, um, you know, um, but again, remember, you know, the, the genetics of hem hemophilia is um, actually, you know, the females are the carriers, right? So, thank you, sir. Another question, sir. If a person is having history of past illness for sarcoidosis, which gene therapy will be advised? <laughs> Uh, that really will not matter. If it's a treated sarcoidosis and they're improved from it, we really don't have a problem. As yeah, long as Prem, it's really all that good. Sorry, sir. Thank you, sir. So, Prem, we will take a few more just questions. and then Yeah, just a few, few more questions and things. Uh, this is a doctor, actually a question for Dr. Apte, whether stem cell related gene therapy is available in India and what would be the cost and whether patient has to be hospitalized? See, uh, we have already discussed, right now the stem cell transplant is available. 
for malignancy. Right now, there is no availability of a stem cell directed gene therapy for hemophilia. The cost would be the cost of the stem cell transplant, which will be roughly 10 lakh rupees, plus the cost of modifying the gene. I, I don't know what that cost will be. Exactly. Approximately two to three weeks, the patient will have to stay in the hospital and then get discharged. And by second or third month, they can be back to community doing all their work. Because generally within eight, eight to 12 weeks, post autologous transplant, the patients are back to the community doing all their work, going to school, going to jobs. So that is not an issue. Issue will be to produce the gene product, which can be tagged to the same cells. And I don't know what the cost will be, but right now it is not available in the country. It's not available. Thank you, sir. Thank the you. person who underwent uh, a successful gene therapy would still pass the original mutated gene to his children. Is a, Prem, I asked the question. question. I, I asked the question. Okay, I'm sorry. I was... Harish, I replied. They would still be, yeah. The gene therapy only fixes it in the in, in other cells. Doesn't sit, okay. fix it in the germ cells, you know, the, or the sperms and ova. Thank you, sir. Why the um, bone marrow transplantation is not done in hemophilia treatment? Uh, so it will not work if you just do a bone marrow transplant because remember hemophilia, uh, the factor eight deficiency is because factor eight is not produced mainly in the liver. So if you have a liver transplant, hemophilia will be cured. For example, hemophilia, um, uh, the, the new liver will make uh, a fact rate. However, bone marrow transplant will not work by itself. This has been nice. Suppressing innate immune system, uh, what will be the effects of that? It may lead to uh, too many diseases to the host or pa patient. Uh, are we asking it in the context of the... Um, um, so the, we actually don't do any immune suppression after any of these gene therapies. Yeah. Um, there is no long-term immune suppression at all. Um, so there is no reason to do that. In fact, if you have an inhibitor and you undergo tolerance induction, or uh, if, you, if you fail that and you are having a more treatment for immune tolerance inhibition, there is more immune suppression there. For gene therapy, there is no immune suppression of immu innate immunity at all. So how is stem cells taken out of the body? Is it? Yeah, so that's actually a good question. So you can actually, uh, so we give patients an injection called GCSF, which is a common injection used to boost the stem cells into the blood. And after that, uh, the next day or the day, couple of days later, they, are get, they get connected to a machine, which basically is like the machine that, you know, when you get plasma derived products or cryoprecipitate or plasma, the donors are undergoing the same thing. You get connected to a machine called a cell separator that takes out your blood. Um, it, it basically centrifuges the blood in a chamber and returns the blood back to you. We take the stem cells away and the blood comes back to the patient. So essentially this is what uh, everyone who's donated plasma, patients who are using plasma derived factor, they're all receiving it from people who have undergone this procedure. It's called a uh, pheresis procedure and it's very commonly done. So there's, there's a supplement question. Uh, sorry, go uh, ahead. Prem. Uh, when we are doing this procedure, is factor replacement therapy needed? Actually, a great question, actually. It's a wonderful question. So when you do this procedure, if you have very good veins, you don't need factor replacement. You can actually just get a vein puncture. And you, you know, you, but otherwise, some patients, if you don't, if you don't have good veins, you might, we might give them a dose of factor to put a, put a line in, a temporary line. Um, so basically, you need an IV line to do it. And that can sometimes go into your neck or your chest. And for that, you might need factor. If you're doing that, if you're, if you definitely need factor if you need a line. But for stem cell collection, many times it can be done without putting a line. If it, there is no line, then there is no factor required. So HIV and uh, hepatitis, uh, are they eligible for gene therapy? Unfortunately, at this time, no. Um, uh, because uh, either the liver-directed gene therapy or the cell-directed gene therapy, both of those are a little bit difficult with that. Because there are clinical trials and patients with hepatitis, you know, hepatitis, you don't want to give something to the liver. Uh, you don't want to create an additional infection in the liver. Uh, with HIV, uh, basically, there are issues with handling the cells. So that's why uh, both of those diseases would be um, excluded right now. Right now, But uh, what, if it's a commercial product, you might be able to get onto it. So is there um, a possible way of doing gene therapy without vector virus? 
Yeah, that's what non-viral yeah, methods. Yeah, have yeah, we, have, we have talked. Yeah. About that. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor um, Natraj. Can you give a uh, vote of thanks? Yeah, just one last question, uh, sir. Could, could you give us some more information about uh, Mars uh, Mars Jesse Mad? Um. Mm, so, uh, I as Shashi, do you know? Uh, is it uh, is that a drug or? Natraj, uh, can you ask it again, please? I don't. I I also didn't yeah, understand. Yeah, I didn't understand the Hari, question. Hari Hari Harishar also did not understand the question properly. Yeah, it's a drug from Pfizer called a Mars Tessimab. Uh, Mars Tessimab. Let me. I actually, I, I so I'm not a good person to answer that question because I don't know. Uh, uh, remember, I told you I only these days I only see the hemophilia in the context of gene therapy. So I really don't know how to treat hemophilia. Um, you know, I'm a hematologist. I, last time I treated hemophilia was many years ago. Um, I'm, uh, I only do the, you know, I have a hemophilia specialist who works with me. I do the gene therapy part, but they do the other part. The, the treatment of bleeding and all that is done by a other specialist uh, who works with me. Thanks. So Thank one, you. one last question to uh, you and Dr. Apti. Um, uh, one of one of our members was uh, rejected from the fetisiron. This is not connected to gene therapy. Fetisiron uh, clinical trials. The question is whether they can take fetisiron in the future. Sorry, I didn't get your question, Prem. Can you come back again? Uh, uh, the question was a uh, 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 CWH was rejected from uh, on from uh, fetisiron clinical trials because of hepatitis. When the product, product comes later, can they take fetisiron or is fetisiron dangerous for them? can be dangerous because see, fetisiron acts as a SNP RNA and it decreases the production of antithromine 3. We know today that if there is a chronic active hepatitis and that uh, if that person takes fetisiron, you may get extremely dangerous low levels of antithromine 3. And the fellow may, in fact, thrombose. So that's a major discussion going on in the world. When somebody is having hepatitis C positive or B positive and has chronic active hepatitis, fetuserin can be dangerous. Can be dangerous. So, Apte, but, sir, one, one Apte, question. One question. Yeah, again <laughs> again and sorry, again. Sorry, Prem. Yeah. yeah I, I think, Prem, you are asking the same question same that thing. you know, we have when seen this everywhere. Again, you just have to. Kind of, kind of repeat. Uh, yes, sir. Please, uh, uh, can you just say when? Well, gene therapy <laughs> available in India? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Some of the centers may be in a position to start the trial now. Yes. The things are at the trial level in the country even now. See, it may take a couple of years to get the approvals. If we get, we know how to do autologous transplant now. Definitely, mm -hmm. there is no issues about autologous stem cell transplant in India. We have to master the technique to transfer the normal gene and have the production through these genes. That is the trick. Yep. Because once that is, uh, what I should say, experienced and expertise, I don't think it will be far away that the gene therapy will be not available in India. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, uh, sir. Uh, Natraj, can you please give the vote of thanks? Yeah. Uh, uh, Natraj, one moment before uh, you come in. Uh, Sashi, sir, you want to uh, give some closing remarks for uh, Hari, sir, please? Yeah. So, Hari, excellent talk as usual. Hari is a great speaker. He has done a terrific work in malignant as well as non-malignant work. And I'm really happy that this trial is progressing and we'll have options of cure which are possible in this country. And thank you, Hari, once again for sparing time with us and our fraternity. Thank you, Hari. Thanks, Sissi. Thank you, sir. Mukesh, do you want to add some closing words? Uh, uh, Sashi sir has said it all, and thank you is a small word for Hari sir and his time. And as I said that, you know, paradigm shift on hemophilia care, now we are looking forward for gene therapy, and we see... 80% of the questions were when it is coming to India. So we are fingers crossed and hopefully that, you know, we all hemophiliacs will be cured I'm one day sure. from the benefited from gene therapy, sir. And I would like to thank Jimmy and Prem to uh, organize it wonderfully. So thank you so much. Hari, sir, Jimmy, uh, Prem. 
natraj thank you sir thank you for giving us the time and uh, over to natraj vote of thanks please yeah thank you prem uh, i really thank hari sir for uh, taking his uh, giving us his wonderful time and uh, it's also uh, uh, very uh, i'm also very happy to know that uh, uh, it's uh, not just like any other sessions before uh, uh, usually uh, treatment we, we we have discussed only about the treatment parts and we had sessions about only treatments and how it is done what will be the future treatments but uh, this is the first time uh, we are having an interactive session uh, with a uh, researcher to my knowledge i i would say uh, with a researcher and uh, you have very beautifully explained in uh, very simple words and also in technically also uh, thank you for uh, being here with us sir and uh, uh, thank you very much uh, on behalf of everybody uh, who are here participated in this session and there are also lots of wishes uh, coming for you uh, from our uh, viewers uh, from youtube and also from uh, uh, zoom and uh, i also wish you uh, we also wish you a, a wonderful uh, success and we also pray that um, your uh, trials uh, should be a very successful one and uh, we all hope to see a cure for hemophilia soon thank you very much and th thanks to all the participants uh, who uh, gave your time to uh, get, getting to know more about gene therapy today and i uh, thank uh, the organizers and uh, ec members of uh, hfi for me giving us this opportunity thank you very much just to add there uh, covid 19 it's a blessing in this guys that we have been organizing webinars back to back and it is we are very fortunate to have somebody a very senior doctor sitting in uh, wisconsin address us so thank you so much sir thank you everybody thank you. Thank you all. Harry, Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hari, I would just request you. Can you repeat that story about COVID? Because this is a thing which is with everybody who is attending in this. Uh, can you just uh, tell that whole story, sir, so that everybody will understand this thing? Yeah, no, no. So that's actually um, it is a story, but it's just a story to understand how COVID is, uh, COVID attacks. Okay, so I'll try to say it in like five minutes. So every virus is an invader into our house, uh, and the house is you, our body. Okay, and our body has an immune system, and the way you need to think about immune system is, you know, we have a, uh, we may have a sentry at the door, at the at the gate. We may have some do dogs. We have a compound wall. Then we have the house itself, and in the house there is a door, and inside the door there is the housekeeper, which is you, your your inner core of the body. <laughs> and then you have you have uh, you know a lati or you have a gun or you have a knife everything and then there is a police force which is outside the house you know they are outside the gate of the house and they are somewhere else okay so the way i think about uh, covid is that a virus actually gets in and for any successful virus we live among the middle of viruses all these viruses are among us all the time you know every virus is trying to attack us and most viruses actually the vast majority don't even get through the door get through the gate they don't even jump the gate So the first line of defense is called innate immunity, and the innate immunity is uh, from some cells called NK cells and some chemicals called interferons. So those two are the big components of innate immunity. When the virus jumps the gate and gets into the house, uh, gets into the um, uh, the, uh, the lawn of the house, your dogs should come and fight it, and your sentry should rush in and try to attack him. So that the COVID virus has successfully managed to avoid that. So when covid attacks us the first few days our innate immune system actually goes to sleep so covid is like an intruder who has actually given some uh, you know sleeping medicine to the dog and the sentry and then when by the, when the by the time you know it you're actually in the house the, the covid is actually inside the house it has actually broken through the door of the house and is and you are actually fighting it but the main immune system that protects you from that is the police force so somebody has to make the call to the police force and the police has to come and arrest him uh, in the meanwhile you are fighting the covid and the, the so what happens is normally you know a virus attacks the dog is slowing him down um the sentry is slowing him down and you are making a call to the police and by the time the police come the the virus is outside the gate uh, door of the house you are you are not having to fight it in the case of covid when the police comes you are actually in the middle of the fight with the covid you are you are the, the housekeeper and the covid are fighting and the police actually don't know who to shoot so they shoot everybody and you, you, they might shoot you the housekeeper too so this is what happens in covid when the first thing the covid comes innate immune system is sleeping then covid attacks and gets into the lungs and the other tissues 
And when the, then the last phase, when patients actually die from COVID, what happens is the T cells, which is our big, uh, the police force, they, when they come, they release a big storm. They call it the cytokine storm. And the cytokine storm basically leads to death. Most of the time when a person dies from COVID, it is actually because our immune system is trying to take out every cell that has got COVID. And the, the immune damage from COVID is what kills patients with COVID. So when you do anti-immune treatments, so the, some of the treatments for COVID is to actually reduce the immunity like dexamethasone, which is the most common successful treatment. Other treatments will work only early on by slowing down the COVID. That is like plasma treatment. When you give plasma from people who've already seen COVID, you're actually basically giving a little bit of help in slowing down the virus so that the immune system, by the time the police comes, they know who is COVID. It's not already inside the house fighting with the members of the household. So that's the, that was the analogy I made because I, people always keep saying we need to boost your immunity. You know, boosting the immunity is not good. It is basically slowing down the COVID so that the immunity can act in a coordinated manner. The dog, the sentry, the housekeeper, the police, the phone call to the police, the police, everybody has to act in a coordinated manner. Then you have actually co controlled the COVID. <laughs> sir, you can be a great storyteller, sir. Amazing yes. way to put it about the police and everything. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we can close it now, sir. Thank you so much Thank and happy you. Navratri so much, to sir. everybody. Happy Navra Navratri. Thank you. Happy Navratri. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you.